Tonight, Rush Limbaugh goes on the record. In a rare interview, Rush tells us President Obama likes scandals. Now, our one-hour interview with Rush Limbaugh. Talking about the scandals, President Obama says the scandals are phony. Why do you think he says they're phony? Because he believes it, or is there a strategy? No, there's a strategy. I, you know, I've, I've been troubled by something with uh, the, the Obama, you know, I playfully call it the regime, because I know it irritates them. But it is, it's like a regime. And I've been troubled, I've been amazed. Here is a man whose policies have done great damage to this country. His policies have done great damage to the economy, have done great damage to the American culture, to the American psyche. I mean, there is a malaise, there's a, there's a, there's a sense of, of, of hopelessness and depression out there. And it's his policies that have done this. And what has always amazed me is how he's not attached to any of it. He has an agenda, he's been implementing it, but the, what I call the low information voters who voted for him and other Democrats do not associate Obama's policies and agenda with the condition of the country, the economy or whatever. That's always befuddled me. I've never, never known a president to be immune from economic circumstances at an election, as he was in 2012. It all became clear to me. There was a New York Times story, I think one of their blog posts on the web back in February. And it basically said, via poll data, what I just said to you. It said most people disapprove of the Obama agenda. They don't like the direction the country's going. They like him, and they think he's great for the country. And I said, how can that be, intellectually? How can a majority of people, oppose, and you know they oppose Obamacare by 55, 60% in, in a number of polls, they are worried about jobs. How in the world can they like him, reelect him, and yet disapprove of everything he's doing? And I came up, well, I call it the Limbaugh theorem. And you hear other people talking about it in the sense that he's a bystander president or he's uh, uh, outside Washington. The way he does this, he never appears to be governing. That's why he's constantly campaigning. Why is there a campaign going on for Obamacare? It's already the law of the land. Why is he out campaigning for all this stuff that's already law? It's already going to happen. And my theory is that Obama has positioned himself as an outsider, not attached to anything that's happening. What he has made happen, he positions himself as opposed to it and against it and fighting for everybody else to overcome what he has done. And that's one of the reasons why the constant campaign. So he doesn't appear to be governing, so he doesn't appear to be part of Washington. So there are, he appears to have this mysterious, powerful bunch of forces that are, that are opposing him and stopping him from creating jobs and stopping him from giving people proper health care and stopping him from making their home values go up. But he's constantly out there fighting it. And he does that by constantly campaigning and never seen to be, to be governing. So all of these scandals, he calls them, uh, no, they're not distraction, they're real. But he likes them because they detract from the absolute reality of what has happened to this country as a result of his policies. Now, let's take a look at selling Obamacare, because I mentioned that in a moment. Why in the world are you on a campaign to sell Obamacare? What, what, what I mean, it's the law. Yeah, you got an effort by the Republicans, two or three of them to defund it, but why the campaign? It's very simple. If you go back to 2010, 2010 midterms, the Republicans, Tea Party created, cleaned the Democrats' clocks. If you go back and look at the 2010 midterms, that was one of the biggest shellackings the Democrat parties had in a long time. The Republicans took back the House of Representatives, but the Democrats lost a total nationwide, all the way down ballot of over 600 seats. And it was because of Obamacare and the rising debt and the fact that nobody was opposing it and nobody stopping it. So Tea Party gets created, these people show up. Now, what Obama and the Democrats really want, what they're salivating about now, is winning the House in 2014. If they get that, hold the Senate, there's no such thing as a lame duck second term. You don't even need a Congress. All they are is going to be a rubber stamp. Whatever Obama wants to do the past two years, just signs it and does it. Congress rubber stamps it, and we've got it going. He can't be stopped. That's why they want it. But they remember 2010. So he's out there trying to change public opinion on health care. 
so that it doesn't replicate in 2014 what happened in 2010, the midterms. He cannot afford for a bunch of Tea Party people, a bunch of anti-Obama voters to show up in 2010, voting against him and, and holding the House for the Republicans and maybe winning the Senate for the Republicans. That's one reason he's campaigning. The second reason he's not campaigning for it is simply to continue this notion that he's not of Washington, that he's outside fighting against these powerful forces, doing everything he can to stand up for the American people. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. I've never seen a president get away with four and a half years of not being seen as responsible for anything he's done when everything that's happened is because of him. He can't be stopped. The Republicans don't have any power. All they can do, maybe, if they get the cojones, is stop things. But they can't make anything happen. The Republicans are totally powerless in terms of legislation and Washington. They have the, the, the House, but nothing in the Senate. They can't stop him anywhere. So, yet he's out acting like he's got to overcome all of this opposition and all of these mean people that want to prevent the American people from realizing their dreams, these dastardly Republicans. So... The phony scandals is just another vehicle to continue the same modus operandi and, by the way, to continue to blame the Republicans, being cold-hearted, mean-spirited, extremist, bigots, racist, sexist, homophobes, war on women, all that stuff. Why do you think, though, um, I mean, a lot of people are unhappy about the phony scandal, at least a lot of Republicans, because a lot of people hate the IRS. In early May, he says this is a serious problem. Now it's phony. And it's just a campaign tactic? Is, is that what you're saying? He's got a slavish media. He can say whatever he wants, and he's not going to be called on it by the media. He can do pretty much everything he wants. I should add, I should have added in, the, in my previous answer to your question, that, that he couldn't get away with any of this without a slavish media. I mean, the media doesn't question him. It just, in fact, that is on board with his agenda and is trying to help him advance it. I, I've gotten to the point where what he says is irrelevant. So he's out there, you, I can give you quotes of what he said in 2002, 2005, 2007 about health care. I give you quotes of what he said about global warming and all these things that they're irrelevant. What you have to do is watch what he does. He's always going to tell you he's not doing what he's doing. He's always going to position himself as having nothing to do with what's happening. He's always going to position himself as... It's the Republicans. They're constantly complaining, whining. I fixed the IRS. I fired whoever did this. It's reprehensible. All he's got to do is talk about how reprehensible he thinks it is. Media reports Obama thinks IRS scandal is horrible. And that's it. The thing that you have to know is, you know, everybody says, I wonder if there's a smoking gun memo, Obama and the IRS. It doesn't need to be one. He hires people puts them in these places. He knows what they're going to do. They're all miniature Obamas. There, there won't be a smoking gun. There doesn't have to be a memo. He doesn't have to, to, to give people that work for him instructions or, an, or a manual on, on how to screw the Republicans or, or, or stop conservatives. That's what they want to do themselves. Plus, they want to make him happy. So I, I think it's incredible what's happening. I think it's out of the world incredible that we have somebody whose policies have led to the malaise and the destruction of the economy and the hijacking of the healthcare industry, and he's not held accountable for it. He tells people that healthcare premiums are going to go down $2,500, and they think that's true because he says it. Uh, the truth is never presented in the mainstream media where most of the low information voters think, uh, get what they think they know. Why does the media give him a pass on that? If, if, if it's as you say, why do they not hold him accountable for things he's said before? They agree with him. They are him. They are, I think they're all part of the elitist uh, New York, Washington, Boston uh, media academic corridor. And they think they are Obama. They think they have the same education, same schools, same worldview. But there's also, I think, um, you know, I've been doing my radio show for 25 years, and it's got a point now where things are starting to repeat. You start hearing the same things over and over about the same issues. And you realize that not a whole lot uh, really changes. And the interesting thing to me about... Obama and the media, I think, 
Greta, the explanation, let me short answer your question, is in 1988 you had CNN, the three networks, and the newspapers, and that was it. There was a media monopoly. My radio show starts in 1988. Even by 1995, I was still the only conservative national media voice, other than some magazines, National Review, and so forth. It wasn't until 96, 97 that Fox came along and other radio talk shows and the blogosphere and the internet blossomed and so forth. And I think that the, the, the media is very aware they've, they've lost their monopoly and now they're in a competitive situation. And I think they get as big a thrill, as, just as all Democrats do, of defeating conservatives as they do helping Obama. I, I think we've never lived in a more partisan country. We've never lived with well, civil war, not included, that was bad. Uh, but maybe, aside from that, I can't remember a time where it's been more partisan, more divisive, and getting worse, and being done on purpose. The division is happening on purpose. The media has aligned with Obama uh, to defeat Republicans, to defeat conservatives, um, and Obama is all about that. That makes them his best friend and vice versa. What happened in 2010? You mentioned 2010. I mean, 2010, 2014. I have no idea. I, because the, you know, if you look at 2010, um, that massive turnout and the vote, there wasn't a Republican on the ballot. And there wasn't a singular Republican voice in electoral politics, I mean, that was articulating an agenda. There wasn't a potential presidential candidate that people were rallying around. That 2010 vote was all anti-Obama. It was all anti-debt. It was all anti-health care. It was all anti uh, the Democrat Party. That's what's got them so bugged about what happened, because there wasn't, the people weren't voting for anything in 20. They were simply saying, ain't no way. No way, don't want any part of this. And so I expected that that same turnout would happen in 2012. And it didn't. It's Why? at home. Why? Well, that opens up a whole can of worms. That's, that, I think, is illustrative of the problem the Republican Party faces. Um, the people that sat home, if you look at the polling data, uh, it was mostly white Republican voters that stayed home. Mostly conservative, dissatisfied with the Republican Party's rejection of conservatism, another nominee that they weren't excited about. Uh, and it has been, it's amazing. Hey, Greg, you look at what happened in 2010. The Republican Party didn't even make an effort to capitalize on that. Here you have a national uprising in opposition to Barack Obama, and the Republicans acted like they didn't want any part of the Tea Party either. The consultants and the powers that be did everything they could to diminish the Tea Party. If I were the Republican Party, I would have embraced those people, I would have brought them into the fold, and I would have done what I could to keep them as donors, as voters. But the Republican Party had no desire. So, and I think in 2012 in the campaign, uh, some of those Republican voters felt that and saw it and said, okay, well, if, if, if you're not interested in our assistance and if you're not interested in what we think in our view of the country, we'll sit at home. Heck with it. Well, the Tea Party, if you actually talk to these Tea Party members, um, they're not kooks. I mean, they're airline pilots, they're shopkeepers, they're family members. I mean, these are people with regular jobs and yet right. they're demonized. Precisely. They're demonized because they don't understand politics, and they're not of Washington, and they can't be controlled. They can't be uh, dominated by the party. Rather, there's, there's a really unfortunate thing uh, happening with the Republican Party. And it, it, as a conservative, it appears to me the Republican Party is trying to push itself away from its conservative base on a number of issues. And I, it's been a very eye-opening thing for me. I always thought that as Republicans, we opposed Democrats. We wanted to beat them. I don't see that. I don't see any pushback against anything Obama wants to do. The pushback's against the Tea Party. The pushback is against conservatives. It's, 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 uh, 
it's a stunning thing. The Republican Party has decided that capitulation with the Democrats seems to be the ongoing strategy. And by capitulation, I mean, I had a guy call me yesterday but talking about uh, this ongoing fight to defund Obamacare, continuing resolution fight and so forth. And he took, this caller, took the exact viewpoint of inside the Beltway Republicans, which is that might involve a government shutdown, and we can't shut down government because their country will hate us. And they cite 1995. And look what happened to Republicans after 1995. No, let's go ahead and let Obamacare be fully implemented, and it will implode on itself, and people will see how bad it is. Well, that's not a strategy. That's capitulation. That's, that's not even pushing back against it. Even if you don't have a chance to stop it, why not make a stand? Tell people who you are as Republicans, as conservatives. You've never had, they've never had, a greater chance to contrast who they are with liberal Democrats and what's happening now. And instead of doing that, the Republican establishment seems to be going along with them. Obamacare, immigration reform, amnesty, whatever it is, there's no disagreement, there's no pushback on it. And I, I remember 1992, people would tell me, Rush, let, let Clinton win, let him win, and then if people see how rotten the Democrats are, and that'll, and I'm hearing the same thing now that Obamacare, let this happen, the American people, find, we've never pulled an entitlement back once it's been implemented, once it's there, it's there, and this is a huge one, this, this changes the relationship, Obamacare does, between citizen and government and state like nothing ever has. Once they have this, health care is the way that they'll have legitimate, and claimed it's constitutional, control over every aspect of everybody's life because everything you do in your life has health care costs related to it. And it, it, they're going to be able to dictate what you eat, how you eat, where you eat, uh, and what kind of health care you get or don't get as a result. And that's the objective of it, is control, the elimination of individual liberty and freedom. And there's no pushback on this. And I'm just, I'm sitting here stunned. Well, and by the, the government shutdown argument, too, is, is 1995, classic point, the Republicans won two seats in the Senate after the 95 budget shutdown and didn't lose that many seats in the House. In addition, because of the shutdown, they were able to set the table for policy that was good that came later. Welfare reform that Clinton ultimately signed. The government shutdown was not a debacle for the Republicans in reality. Now, it was on TV. It was in the media. The Republicans were accused of starving children. Remember that? Little kids in New Orleans are writing letters to, to Republicans, please don't cut the school lunch program. I can't study if I'm hungry. Republic, there were no cuts in the school lunch program. There were actual increases. There were just not going to be as, uh, increases as high, so they called it a cut. That's the Washington cut. It's a typical baseline budget cut. But the point is that, that the media portrayed this as a debacle and an absolute disaster for the Republicans, and Clinton cleaned Gingrich's clock. But in reality, the Republicans won two seats, set the stage for some pretty good things that happened policy-wise after that. It's not a debacle to shut down the government. But the, here's the point. A majority of people oppose Obamacare. Whatever poll you look at, why does not the Republican Party want to embrace that? I mean, the Republican Party's got a problem, right? They haven't won elections lately. The majority of the American people don't want this. Why doesn't the Republican Party embrace them, bring them in, and try to grow and have a, at least come up with a way to reach out and attach themselves to these people, a majority of voters? Instead, they're capitulating with what the Democrats want, and not just on this, but on, on immigration, amnesty, whatever you want to call it. And I swear, for the longest time, I didn't understand it because I was looking at it the, uh, the wrong way. And straight ahead, Rush Limbaugh has much more to say. And why is Rush dead set against compromise in Washington? And does he have a better idea to fix the country? Rush will tell you. And also, guess who Rush admires in the Republican Party? Nothing, you kid. The Republican Party wants a new base. They just... The Republican leadership isn't conservative. They're not particularly crazy about 
conservatives. I mean, I, I, I'm fairly prominent media conservative. I get more grief than the Taliban gets. I get more grief than Al Qaeda gets, and all conservatives do. It's a um, because we do constitute a threat to the way Washington views the country. Uh, and I don't think it's so much conservative versus liberal, although it is, but it's Washington versus the rest of the country is what's really transpiring now. And Washington has a mindset and a desire for the country that doesn't dovetail with the majority of the American people. So what is the future of the Republican Party based on what you say? I really don't know. I, 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 um, because politics is too unpredictable. There is anything that we're not even conceiving as possible with a scandal or some such thing that could happen which could cause people to start voting against Democrats in droves regardless what the Republicans do. So it's, it's dangerous to start predicting the demise of political parties and so forth and I'm, I'm not doing that. I'm just, I'm just sharing with you the, the sense I get as a conservative 25 years of doing this on this show and watching it all, and so much of it on the surface intellectually doesn't make any sense. There has to be a reason. These Republicans are not stupid. They have to know that agreeing with the Democrats on issue after issue after issue is going to equal Democrat victory after victory after victory. So why are they doing it? Is there no room for negotiation bipartisanship? I mean, is it just opposition? Between who? Between the two parties. I mean, is, I mean, is, should there? Are you suggesting the Republicans shouldn't negotiate and have a bipartisan approach with Democrats? Well, yeah, pretty much because I don't think we have anything in common with them. I mean, where's where's the commonality? I don't having a common with Obama policy-wise, zilch, zero, nada. You know, compromise is portrayed as this wonderfully erudite and elite superior form of existence and too often what it means in Washington is that conservatives have to compromise their core in order to be considered nice people or what have you I, I, I'm about defeating them granted not compromising with them they don't what, it compromised a one-way street. Why don't you, not you, why does the press ever ask Obama or any Democrats, why don't you, are you willing to compromise? What are you willing to give up? It's always a one-way street. What do the Republicans have to do to make something work? What do the Republicans have to change to make something work? And the reason it works on the Republicans, they're shell-shocked. I mean, the Republicans, you know, the image of racist, sexist, bigot, homophobe has taken hold. They think that's what people think of them. I think they've lost their confidence. I think they're nervous. I think they're scared. Like everybody else, they want to be loved. And they have bought into this notion of why they're hated and disliked. They're trying to change that rather than defeat the people responsible for it all. I'm about defeating them within the political arena of ideas. I'm not talking about anything of a deleterious nature, just defeat them in the arena of ideas. I think our ideas will trump Obama's ideas every day, but he doesn't want our ideas on the table. He's not about ideas, he's brute force. Obama's about eliminating opposition, not working with it. So why should we help him? I think the Democrats are the people need to be defeated. There's nothing about what they believe that I want to compromise with. I want to defeat it. Look at the country, it's hanging by a thread here. As founded, it's hanging by a thread. We're about to lose it. Who do you Why compromise with the people responsible for this? And Rush taking us inside the battle for the Republican Party. Who do you admire in Republican politics and why? I admire any who are bold enough and brave enough to speak about what they truly believe. Ted Cruz is one. Sarah Palin is another. Um, the, you know, the, the, any, any of them who are fearless and have the courage of their convictions and have no compunction about saying it, they're not embarrassed of themselves, they're not insecure, they firmly believe what has to be done and are willing to stand behind it. Those are the people I admire. What are the chances those people would ever get a nomination in the Republican Party? Probably not big. Um, I don't, why, why would that be the case? 
because they are outside the mainstream of Republican politics as you outlined it? Well, I don't think the mainstream of Republican politics can't be beat. I mean, there's a, there's a battle for the party going on. Um, and sure, it's, it's, it'd be a tough battle, but there's no other option. You don't want to go third party. That just, that, that just ensures the Democrats are majority party forever. You don't want to do that. So you, you have to do what you can to work within the Republican Party to take it over. I think the right conservative candidate could score. Reagan did it. I know a lot of people, could you stop talking about Reagan? But Reagan, uh, there's only one of them, but Reagan is a real life example of what can be done and what happens when a prominent conservative triumphs. The country and the Democrat Party set out trying to revise history about him and destroy his reputation and image and so forth. It's a, it's a never-ending battle. A lot of people probably say, why? why? Why are Republicans and conservatives so, um, for lack of a better word, disliked? I mean, the real battle, folks, that, that I think is going on is on the one hand, the country is founded with liberty and freedom and the government as a servant versus another view which says the government is all powerful and all everything and it's the people who are servants. And that's what the battle is right now. Yeah, you know, tell you an interesting little story if I have time. You do? I have time. Um, a media person wrote a story on me about how I am losing. I am failing. Uh, Obama's been elected twice. Uh, my radio audience uh, wouldn't crack the top 10 of TV shows and so forth. And I said, look at how I'm being measured. I'm a guy on the radio. I'm being measured against people who can give people health care, who can give people tax cuts, who can give people food stamps, who can give people cell phones. I can't give anybody anything. I can't give them food. I can't give them cell phones. I can't give them a tax break. I can't, I can't do anything for anybody like Obama can. The Democrats can buy as many votes as they want, and Republicans who want to get on that game can too. I can't. Why am I being measured against politicians who have real power? I don't have any power. I have, I, I, zilch zero, not a guy on the radio. I'm in the arena of ideas. And I try to do as entertaining a show as I can. But this, this writer was going to portray me as, I was, I'm failed. I've bombed out. I have seen my better days. Obama's beating me left and right. It's not, I'm a guy on the radio, but why are they putting me in this arena? Well, why, why is a guy on the radio being measured against people who have their hands on a budget of three trillion dollars and the reason is I happen to be an articulate spokesman of the opposing point of view and whenever an articulate spokesman of the opposing part point of view which is government first last and always that spokesman's got to be discredited taken down it's it's a it's a massive fight but the forces that believe government should be the center of everybody's universe are massive and big. The Democrat Party wants government to use it as a weapon against their enemies. I mean, the idea they wanted to use it to help people. Look at the people they've been helping for 50 years, 30 years. They're in no better shape than when the Democrats first took them under their wing. But under Reagan and uh, conservative governors and so forth, people prosper economically. They triumph. They overcome odds because they're turned loose. And they're not shackled by government laws, power, controls, and what have you, but the forces of government control are massive and large, and they can buy votes, and they can buy goodies, and they can play Santa Claus. I can't. Coming up, Rush Limbaugh talks unemployment, poverty, and immigration, and why he says the Democrats are making it all worse. More from Rush Limbaugh next. How much protein does your dog feel? We're talking one-on-one -on -one with Rush Limbaugh, and he has plenty to say about the economy and jobs. In the arena of ideas, what would you do to solve a problem like Detroit or even something bigger like the credible growing class of poor people? Well, what you want to do first? Either. Take your pick. Okay. Detroit, the first thing you got to do is analyze what really happened there. Why did it go wrong? Now, there's some obvious things. The city has been run by Democrats unchecked since, I think, the last Republican mayor 
was 1957. Okay, you've had that that town has been a a petri dish of everything the Democrat Party stands for, everything the Democrat Party loves. Massive unions, massive pensions, pay people pensions and health care long after they've stopped working. The math doesn't add up. Um, you have massive welfare states where citizens are given things left and right in order to buy their votes. You have no opposition whatsoever. Then in the case of Detroit, you throw race into the mix and you bring on Mayor Coleman Young, who, who causes the riots in 1967 in Detroit, and Mayor Young calls a white flight to suburbia, and Detroit is left with nothing but liberal Democrats running it. It is what it is. And you, any place in this country that has similar circumstances, the same fate is going to happen to them. Now, what was your thing about poverty, how to bring poverty? People? Yeah, because LBJ said the war on poverty, <laughs> we're going to have legislation to try to eradicate. The, the poverty is growing. It's not getting better. There are a lot of people suffering. Yeah, imagine that. And it's been the number one issue the Democrat Party out of their mouths for, well, since 1964, when LBJ first started to care about poverty. Percentage-wise, the same number of people. In fact, under Obama, it's gotten worse. Four out of five American families are experiencing poverty. Nine million jobs have been lost, pardon me, since Obama took office. Nine million. They're just gone. So because of his policies, well, the arena of ideas, this is where the Republican Party's not standing up. They're not pushing back. They're not articulating what is the opposite to this. And one of the things, I mean, you, you can point to successful people all over the country, no matter how successful or different levels of it. You point to them. How'd they do it? That's all you have. How did they do it? Well, there are recipes. They cared. They worked hard. They had ambition. They learned what they had to learn. Some of them might have had connections here and there. Nobody does everything by themselves. But you're certainly not going to eradicate poverty by creating dependency. Santa Claus is not a cure for poverty. It isn't going to happen. All it is is a way to buy votes. That's, that's why the Democrats want amnesty. See, the Democrat Party needs a permanent underclass. They need a certain level of poverty. They need a certain level of uneducated, hopeless, unskilled people to vote for them. That's their base. And as in a normal economy, as those people escape the bonds of poverty and rise to the middle class, become more self-reliant, they don't need Santa Claus. They don't need the Democrats. So they start voting other ways. Hello, Amnesty. We've got 11 million illegals here. And by polling data alone, 8 million of them are going to vote Democrat the minute they're given the chance. That's why all this talk about solidarity with Hispanics and compassion and the wonders and beauties of immigration. It's all BS. The Democrat Party needs a permanent underclass and they need this, this they, they're salivating at all those eight million or more votes. Now you might say, but Rush, the immigration bill that's being debated doesn't grant them the right to vote for 14 years. You know what's going to happen? If this thing becomes law, say amnesty, whatever it is, pathway to citizenship, we bring them out of the shadows. And about five hours after that happens, Chuck Schumer is going to go near his camera and talk about how unfortunate and unfair and how lacking in compassion it is that we have just told these people they're on the pathway to citizenship, but they can't vote. And we've got to do something about that. And they're going to be able to vote within six months after this thing, because that's what is, is cared. On the Republican side, unfortunately, there is this, there's thinking that there's certain uh, work that people simply won't do that needs to be done. The American people, uh, Democrat voters have become conditioned to not working. Take, look at poverty. You brought it up. Look at poverty in this country. Everybody out of work is eating. They got big screen TV, probably have a car, probably have a cell phone that they're using. Uh, and they got a place to live. Being out of work is not poverty. The Democrats have taken care of that, and so there is a complacency.